What's up, guys? I'm Evan. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about building universal applications. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this. Uh, when I say universal application, what I mean is an application that you write once and then you can run anywhere. And today, we're mostly going to be focusing on mobile apps and websites. So this presentation, just like any great project, starts with the question of, do you build an app or a website? And the reason you need to choose is because the stack is totally different. Uh, for apps, you can use a cross-platform tool like React Native or Xamarin or Flutter. And to build a website, there is a bunch of options like React and Angular View, WordPress, of course. But what if you could build both? Like, what if you had the bandwidth? What if you could afford to? Uh, like, a lot of big companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, I can name a lot of companies. Uh, what would that look like? And the answer is uh, basically an identical product. So this is Twitter. Uh, we have the web version and the, the native app version, and they look uh, almost identical across like everything. And there's a lot of great uh, like reasons for this. Like you don't want to lock your user into the platform; you just kind of want to lock them into your service. So having it look the same everywhere is really great. So going back to that list of solutions I showed you guys earlier, uh, I'm going to discuss how one of them can be used to create truly universal apps today. And that is React Native. So let's talk about React. That's like a phrase I say almost every day now. Let's talk about React. It's got a lot of great features. It has an amazing community. It's got great examples. It's got hooks. So uh, when you make a website with React, you use something called React DOM. And React DOM uses an XML-style system called JSX, which renders to HTML. And it promises we'll get more complicated here in a second. So, it looks like HTML, but it's not. And then React Native came along, and it provided all of those great React features, but now you could use them to make iOS apps. And uh, instead of going for platform-specific names like React DOM, it used these platform-agnostic names like Vue and Image and Text. And because of that, a guy, Christoph Majira, who was working at Facebook, created React Android which didn't need to change any of the API. It just used that same view, image, and text, these primitives. So what is a primitive? Well, say you want to render text to a screen, right? Any text, any screen. In the browser, you would use something like a span or a P or an H1 or any kind of element. And then on iOS, you would use a UI label. And on Android, you would use a text view from the Android SDK. But a primitive would be something like text where you write it once, and then based off where you run it, it binds to the correct native element. So uh, it seems difficult, but well, I mean, it is a little difficult. And this is something that Nicholas Gallagher worked on solving when he was at uh, Twitter and made React Native for Web. And the reason I give this really long-winded explanation is because the name React Native for Web uh, is pretty bad. It kind of insinuates that he took React, which is awesome, it made it work natively, which is awesome. And they made that work back on the web, which is like kind of redundant. But that's not what it does at all. What it really does is it takes that primitive style of using view, image, and text, and it applies that to web. And uh, it's really cool. A lot of people are really into this. All of these dope companies here, like Major League Soccer uh, and the Times, they all use React Native for Web for their PWAs, desktop PWAs, supplementary websites, personal projects, lots of things. Uh, and Twitter, which at the time of giving this presentation, which is like the sixth biggest website, uh, is written in React Native for Web. At least the new version is. Uh, so it's awesome, and everyone must be using it, right? Well, not, not fully right. Uh, it's used a lot less than React Native. This blue line up here encapsulates Android and iOS. And then down here, this is web. And so my first inclination was just that like, maybe people don't actually make websites. Maybe they just mostly make you know, native apps. And then I added React DOM and realized that was very wrong, uh, 16 times wrong to be exact. So uh, why, why is this? Because if you used web with React Native, you would have like, that identical website and native app. It's very performant. It's a proven technology. Uh, so like, why isn't everyone using it? And I kind of identified a few major issues with how people were approaching React Native for Web. And that way, we'll explore them in order of most interesting to least interesting. 
So to first understand the issues with React Native for Web, we need to understand the issues with React Native. And the, the biggest core issue with React Native is that uh, if we look at some of these apps, these are all iOS 13 apps right here. Uh, as you can see, they're very complicated. There's a lot going on on the screen. Uh, and all of these apps cannot be built with the modules provided by React Native. That's because React Native, like React DOM, is a library and not a framework. So it relies heavily on community uh, libraries to create comprehensive apps. But whereas with React DOM, you can create those community libraries with JavaScript. React Native, you need to know Objective-C and Java. So it's, it's thoroughly harder. Um, so if we look at just three of these, we have like maps, gestures, videos, navigation. I read everything off the screen. Uh, if we look at just these, none of these are provided in React Native, and they're all pretty critical to making a lot of different apps. Like navigation, every single app uses that. So when people want to make production-ready applications with React Native, what a lot of people do is they use a framework called Expo. Now, I love Expo. It's the best. I work on Expo. And with Expo, you can use it to create production-ready applications for iOS, Android, and pretty soon web. Well, I mean, kind of already with web. And uh, it's really exciting. I work on the Expo for web which is this new project which kind of takes and solves the same problems that Expo solved with React Native, but it does that for web. And Expo makes things easy by providing kind of three things, or at least I can fit three things in the talk. So the first one is the universal API, arguably the most fun. And the second one is a, uh, it's a bunch of services built around Expo, which just makes it easier. It kind of lowers the barrier for getting into building native apps, and we'll look into that in a second. And then the last one, Webpack, or just kind of the config. There's a lot of dev tools built around it because native apps are hard to develop, and as we'll see here in a second, React Native can also, React Native Web can also be very hard to uh, dig into. So I find the best way to demonstrate the Universal Expo API is just to clone an app with it and then to walk through how I clone that app and show you guys how things work. I built this natively first with iOS and Android and then was able to just run it as a web app, which is really cool. I've got this little demo just in case the Wi-Fi didn't work, but it is working. So I'm going to hop over here. This is a website. Uh, it's published now, so you can go to it if you want. It's called expogram.netlify, and I'll tweet out all the links afterwards. But here, we can just scroll through this, and oh, I see. It's not on the screen. That, that is troublesome. Well, luckily, I have that video. It's almost like I planned for things to go wrong. OK, so here's the video of what the website looks like. Again, it's expogram.netlify, so you can visit it if you want. And right here, this is just a standard mobile browser uh, running on an iPhone. As you can see, it's got a live camera feed running. It has a blur view running on top of that. There's nothing special here. There's no native modules involved. It's all just standard browser stuff. There's no WebAssembly. It's using cutting edge browser features. And it's just a recreation of what the Instagram camera looks like. So over here, it's also pulling in a bunch of uh, the audio from the iTunes API, which can stream on top of that. So there's a lot of very intensive things. Usually when I show people this demo, uh, it's a lot of things that maybe they didn't know could even be done in a browser. Before making that, I didn't actually know they could be done in a browser. Uh, and so we'll kind of walk through how it all works. So if we look at like the profile page, uh, it's got a lot of these very basic primitive elements, things like images, buttons, texts. Uh, all of these are provided by React Native, so you don't really need anything special to make them. But then when you dig into like the camera stream, and this is my Soylent collection, when you dig into the camera screen, uh, it gets a lot less forgiving. There are so many native modules in this. So we have fonts, SVG, audio, and you might be thinking like SVG and fonts are very easy to do in the browser, and you're right. Uh, they're a lot harder to do natively, though. And so every single thing that you can do needs to have a library which works uh, universally across everything. So if it's difficult on one platform, it needs a library so you can make it work universally. And then, of course, there are 
uh, various libraries like AR is a good example that are platform specific. AR stands for augmented reality. And uh, we need a way to like get around this uh, platform specific functionality when it's not supported. So here I've got a pretty scientific graph and it shows how uh, AR probably works in the app. Uh, I use it for like face filters like the, the dog filter in Instagram. Uh, so here we've got AR, maybe we put it in a file called AR.js and then it renders cool stuff. Uh, that's computer science. So then in web where it's not supported, we might have a file called .web.js and then the bundler knows to do some like bundler magic and resolve the file with the more platform specific extension. So from a DX perspective, it's pretty straightforward to create and then to also circumvent features that don't work everywhere. And a really cool side effect of this is that PWAs or progressive web apps are uh, extremely easy to build with the system. In fact, you don't really need to build them at all. They just kind of work automatically. Uh, and nowadays, a lot of people really expect all of this functionality in your, your website, like offline support and well, mostly just offline support, right? So if we look at uh, like this diagram here, I think safe area view is a really good example of this. It's something that you don't think about when you actually develop your website because you have a URL bar, which you know prevents you from getting into the notches. Uh, but when you make a native app, you have to think about the safe area all the time. And that means that all the libraries like navigation, they consider the safe area and lists. So if you build a native app, and then you run that in the browser, when you make a PWA, it kind of waters down any features which aren't available, but then you kind of end up with this PWA which looks pretty much identical to your native app, which is really cool. Uh, so you get things like the splash screen and the app icon and offline support all just kind of bundled into it by default because it knows how to do that automatically, like you already built it in there. Um, so let's take a look under the hood really quickly. That's like a, a car reference. Let's take a look under the hood and I can explain how it got to be uh, easy because it was not always very easy to use. So who here knows what a bundler is? Okay. And who here knows like how that bundler works? Nice. So for the people watching on the stream, everyone just raised their hands because they can only like see my face. Uh, but I will explain how a bundler works. So. Essentially, a bundler is like the build step for your project. It's going to take all of the files and put them in one big file, and then it will remove all of the code that you're not using, or at least it will tell you that, and then it will minify it and break it out into smaller files. So there's a lot that can go wrong there uh, in that build step. And uh, something that I found, like maybe the only thing more inconvenient than working with a bundler is uh, working with two bundlers. And React Native, it uses this bundler called Metro, which is a custom bundler made at Facebook, and it exists. And then the rest of the React Native, or the React community, uses Webpack, uh, like Next and Gatsby and Storybook and Create React App. Everyone, I love Webpack, it's awesome. Uh, so for the web projects, we use Webpack, and then for the native projects, we use a totally different bundler. So getting that configuration to be right can be tricky. And as much as I love Webpack, it does have kind of an issue with it, and that issue is that it's very difficult to use. Uh, there is a lot of configuration, and if you want to get started with React Native for Web, you need to remove all of the iOS and Android code from your project. All that happens in the bundler. You need to remap React Native to React Native Web. So you kind of need to have like a pretty thorough understanding of how Webpack works, even just to like get started using it. Whereas with Next and Gatsby, you don't really ever touch the Webpack config unless you need to. And then to add on top of that, if you wanted to use React Native for Web with any of your favorite tools, which why wouldn't you? They're awesome. Uh, you have to now take their proprietary config and mix it with your config. And so that pretty much just requires a very thorough understanding of how it all works. So maybe you can kind of start to see why it hasn't really taken off as much as it should have, or at bigger companies where they've got very talented engineers, why they love using it, and then anyone passively using it for a side project is not picking it up. But it doesn't need to be that way, right? We can make it easier. Uh, so I actually have a thing here 
where I can demonstrate how easy it is, but I don't know if I'll be able to get that showing. I'll probably go over here, mirror the screen. Cool. All right, there was that demo I was going to show you earlier. So right here, this is a website called snack.expo. If you're familiar with uh, Code Sandbox or Code Pen or JS Fiddle, it's a code editor in the browser. The only difference is this one is uh, it lets you write native apps. In fact, this is probably the easiest way to make native apps uh, because you can just hit this URL and start coding them. But we added the web feature to it. And if I open up the file browser over here, you see there is no Webpack config, no Babel config. You can add them and then start extending it, but you do not need that by default. All of that functionality has very meaningful defaults, and you can build on top of it. Um, and then you can just start coding it live in the browser. So I can you know, add a bunch of random junk, and it'll update over here. Or if I wanted to add a camera, like I could import the primitive, import camera from Expo Camera, and then just export that object, like that JSX. I'm going to actually open this one over here in like a, another browser window. And just like that, it is now running a, a universal camera, which runs the same way on iOS, Android, and web, and any other platform which Expo chooses to support. That's a really bad angle of me. So. Uh, it's that simple to just use these primitives, just roll them into production. If I kind of add this back, maybe I'll like add the camera in here. Oh, dang it, I forgot. I can't code when people are watching. Uh, so I'll add the camera, and then maybe I'll add like the blur view on top of it. I say maybe, but it's commented out here, so you definitely know I planned this ahead of time. Uh, so I'm going to just add a blur view on top of the camera just to kind of demonstrate how simple it is to do a lot of this stuff. Open this up in another a thing over here. Uh, you don't usually need to open up the second browser window to do this. This is just unique to streaming it. And... Let's start cutting out features till we get to the um, a working space. So here is the camera working. And then if I add a blur view on top of that, now it is blurry. And uh, as you can see, you can just kind of construct these advanced primitives all on top of each other. And uh, it's a very simple, very easy to use system. So I'm going to jump back over to the presentation now for a second. Well, actually, while I have it open, I'll just show you some like examples of how this works. So like, here's a, a game that I made with Expo Web. It's really cool. It's called Crossy Road. Uh, it's based off another game that already exists, which, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I cloned this using it just kind of to demonstrate that you don't, like it's not limited to UIs. You could also build games using any of the awesome game tools that already exist. So like this one's made with 3JS and I fall into the water, and these are all React Native views that come on top of it, and it's very bright and colorful. So you can make really any kind of thing that you want with it, and this runs the same way for iOS, Android, and web. I tried to put it in the App Store, but as you can imagine, they did not approve it because it is a copyrighted thing already. So now I'm going to switch back over to the Keynote. That's the part where I talk about the video games. And now I'm going to talk about what is next. So what can we do with this? Where's the roadmap? Where, where do we want to go with this in the future? And the first place is to stability, right? We want to move it out of beta. There are still some like open questions about things which don't make a lot of sense universally. The biggest one is just navigation, because navigation for mobile apps is very different from navigation in web apps. Uh, 
Like here we've got stack navigators, we've got tab navigators. Uh, these are all way different than routing because like a stack navigator, you kind of load all the pages into memory, whereas with a, a web page, you just switch to whichever page you want. Another cool native navigation thing is shared element transitions, which is when you take one element on the page and you move to another page and that element comes with you. Uh, this is something which is a part of Expo. It's in this library, React Native Shared Element, and it's already in React Native, so it would not be too difficult to add it to web. And it is, I mean, it looks awesome, and it's got like anime, so I, I would also like to have it working in web. And just like going forward from there, Expo kind of made it very easy to, uh, probably the easiest ever, to build a, an iOS and an Android app using the same code base as well. And now with web, you can render to all of these new uh, browsers and all of these new targets can run your app. And uh, it's not too difficult to see how you can add desktop support from there, maybe using Electron or Project Catalyst, which is Apple's new way of running iOS code on OS X. And uh, then just building out from there, there's a lot of ways that you can add and extend this. But whenever you add a new platform to Expo, your existing Expo app it doesn't need to be updated in any way, right? It just, that same primitive code will apply to whichever platform Expo supports. I like to think of it like when you write a JavaScript app, you don't think if it like targets Skia or something, you just know that if it runs on Chrome, then it will run wherever Chrome runs. And uh, it runs like that, except fully natively with access to all browser and DOM features. So anyways, in summation, that is why I think Expo, now with the addition of web, is how people can truly write their apps once and run them everywhere. And that's all I got for you guys today. Thanks so much for listening. You guys have been great. I'm going to be around answering questions. Uh, I'll also tweet out the link to the slide and to all the websites and things that I mentioned in this presentation. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'm done talking now. You can hear me. You can hear me now. That was Evan Bacon. Evan, come here. I want you to see what he's wearing for his shoes. Oh, yeah. That's sure. the real dedication to our cause here. So thank you for doing that. Oh, yeah, that. that's what I was doing. So I know we have two questions for you. Dude is asking, so Expo is nice to show components, but what is about routing React Router? Is that possible, or will it route to a different domain? Was that asked before the navigation part? Uh, I think uh, there is still like this kind of open question around like how routing will work with native navigation, but I think that there is something that we use called a switch navigator. Um, we're also investigating more lightweight options besides React Router, but currently the way I recommend people do things, the way that um, a lot of websites are using uh, Expo Web right now is they are just using React Router for web, and then they're using a native solution like React Navigation for their native router. And it works for them. <laughs> and then we have a second question. Are your implementations of Instagram and Crossroads open source? Of course. Of course, it's all open source. Uh, I'll tweet out links to it. Uh, the people who make Crossroads have asked me to take it down a lot. So maybe they will after they see this. Uh, but the Instagram one, is it's open source as well. And it's all on my GitHub. And uh, you can just get all the code there. I don't really close source anything or even have a, a pro GitHub account. 